Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. Our listener support campaign continues. You can become one of our Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month. Just go to patreon.greatdetectives.net. And now let's get into this week's episode of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. And we're going to bring you a Gerald Moore episode I've been wanting to bring you for a while. I think a season or so back... Uh, We were actually going to play it. The website that I downloaded it from and listened to it uh, several years ago uh, essentially forbid sharing the episode and did not uh, release me from that uh, agreement. Uh, But it appeared they'd gone out of business, but they came right back up as I was getting ready to record the episode, uh, so I had to replace it with something else. However, since that time, the episode has come into circulation, and so I'm using a file I downloaded elsewhere. Uh, This episode I'm going to play for you today is actually the sixth episode of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe with Gerald Moore. The original air date is October the 31st, 1948, and the title is The Blue Bergenette. They were all after it. An importer, a beautiful woman, a nut, and a guy I couldn't figure out. But before we were through, one was in the hospital, two were in the morgue, and the fourth was waiting for the hangman. All that because of a blue bergenette, which was something I'd never even heard of before. From the pen of Raymond Stanton, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character. Yes. Put your The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Gerald Moore starred as Philip Marlowe. We bring you tonight's exciting story, The Blue Bergenette. The knock on my glass paneled office door sounded like a fresh out of Yale insurance salesman making his first enthusiastic call of the morning. Yet when the door swung open... I was surprised to see a man with no more height and weight than a jockey. And all the boyish bounce of a New Year's Day hangover. He was about 40 and too carefully groomed. From pearl gray Hamburg through pearl gray Stickton to pearl gray Spats. But when he started to talk, each sentence held too much self-assurance. And I didn't like it. My name is Norman Boring. I'm an importer located here in Los Angeles, in San Francisco, and in the area. I'm Philip Marlowe, private detective, located all in one place, which means that your rent bill is higher than mine, and that's all. I have little time for flipping things. And I have less time for high-handedness. I don't make ends meet by pulling a rickshaw either, Mr. Voorhees. Cigarette? I don't... Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Marlowe, I need an escort for a crate of rare silks, which is to be flown to San Francisco tonight. At 25 a day plus expenses, I could be your man. I so much fuss over a few bolts of silk. In this case, it's the embroidery on the material. A very rare and very intricate Chinese design. Which, in basic English, means what? Oh, come, come, Marlowe. The silk was legitimately purchased at a low figure. And a profitable resale is my only object. Then why the pistol packing routine? Because I was forced to outsmart a half dozen competitors to get this material. Hmm. There are poor losers in every business, is that it? Exactly. Now, will you uh, take the job? All right. Where do I report and when? At my warehouse on South Figueroa. At nine tonight, here's my card. Either my assistant, Miss Sandra Lane, or I will be on hand. Fine. Oh, and by the way, Mr. Voorhees, I didn't mean to snap your head off when you first walked in. It's just that I'm quick to resent being pushed around. Don't apologize, Mr. Marlowe. If you hadn't been that quick, I wouldn't have hired you. Good day, sir. I stared at the decollet card. Boris had given me and smiled until the staccato report of his built-up heels had faded down the corridor. 
I dropped the card into my pocket, punched out a couple of overdue letters on my Remington Rand, and left the office for lunch. Outside, the sun was too high and the smog too low for local comfort. So, with nothing to do until nine, I decided to drive out to the pier in Santa Monica, where I could eat French fried shrimp and watch the seagulls collect overhead and swear at me. But when I got to my car and opened the door, I suddenly forgot about lunch. Because a man was crossed inside my car waiting with a gun in his hand. Get him, Marlowe, quickly. Then start the car and drive until I tell you to stop. What are we going to do about the red lights, bud? Hurdle them? Marlowe, start the car or I'll kill you. That's nice and congenial of you. Okay, where to? Just drive and listen carefully. I'm a foreigner. No. Yes. My name is Leonardo Baltiera. Does that mean anything to you? Frankly, no. Then again, I haven't checked the rogues' gallery in almost a month. Stop it, Marlowe. I haven't traveled the week of this country without a moment's sleep to hear empty words. No. Where is the blue bergonet? The blue what? The bergonet. The blue bergonet, Marlowe. Where is it? Look, Baltiera, maybe you have all your marbles and maybe you don't. But either way, believe me, I've never heard of a, a, a burgonet, red, white, or blue. Don't lie to me, Marlowe. With my own eyes, I saw him going to your office. Lurie's. Lurie's? What's he got to do with it? Everything. He stole the burgonet from me. You know that. Lurie's never mentioned such a thing to me. You lie. I've only been here in Los Angeles an hour, but already I know that Lurie has the burgonet. And I swear, I swear by all that's holy, it will be in my hands where it belongs before morning. And if you don't... Marlowe, watch out. Watch out. I just had my fender straightened out. All right, all right, all right. Don't move, Marlo, don't move. I still got the gun and I still shoot. Now remember, I'll be back for the bird to because it's mine. And I'll never rest until it's safely here in my hands. Before I could make a pass at Bartieri, he was gone. I apologized to the cop, the truck driver, and the gaping mob that was disappointed not to find me bleeding, and then... I went for a telephone to call Mr. Voorhees and complain about a madman, a blue burgonet, whatever that was, and a pleated fender. But there was no answer at the warehouse. A fistful of nickels disappeared before I finally found an importer who knew that Voorhees lived at 1330 North Camden Drive in Beverly Hills. Half hour later, I turned onto a gravel driveway and crunched to a stop in front of a house which was redwood and glass and guess where the front door is. The landscaping consisted of a mess of severely clipped trees that even Joyce Kilmer would have turned his back on. When I leaned against the front doorbell, a slew of Chinese gongs rang someplace deep inside. And I was ready for at least two man shoes when the door eased open noiselessly. Oh, the collection of beautiful things that stood five and a half feet above the threshold was about as Chinese as a butterscotch Sunday and had a complexion to match. Her waistline was rye crisp and lettuce leaves. But the rest of her, strictly steak and potato. Her eyes were something a little greener than envy. And when she spoke, I couldn't figure out what Boris wanted with a bunch of old oriental chimes. You always stay like that. Well, it's more polite than panting. <laughs> Besides, you were a surprise. I expected either Boris or something with a moon face in a kimono. Now may I come in? Sandra. How did you know my name? I get around. Oh, you must be Mr. Marlowe. Uh-huh. Uh, please come in. Mr. Voorhees is finishing some business in the study, but I... Oh, here he is. Now, if I'm sure we'll both be more than satisfied for this. Yes, of course we will. The arrangements suit you, Norman. They're bound to make me happy. You're always happy for this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mr. Marlowe. Uh-huh. Well, I didn't expect you. Excuse me a moment, please. Sure. Well, today I'll see both you and the money tonight. Right. We'll be waiting side by side. <laughs> well, goodbye, Norman. Who's laughing, boy? I don't know. I haven't seen through Mr. Voice personal mail yet today. Uh, Your Honor, you're on the wrong place at the wrong time. What's the trouble? A blue burgonet. A what? Oh, that again. What do you know about the burgonet, Mano? Nothing, but a nut with a gun in his hand wouldn't believe that. Now, you tell me, just what is a blue bergen at, Mr. Voorhees? It's an ancient ceremonial helmet. Oh, you mean that night in armor stuff? One of those tin cans with a hinged front for picking your teeth? Yes, but this particular helmet was only ornamental. It's made of solid gold and covered with jewels. It was completed in 1560 by none other than the great Italian master, Benvenuto Cellini. 
The entire helmet, or Bergenet, as that particular style is called, is decorated with a brilliant blue enamel, also the work of Cellini. And it hasn't lost its luster even to this day. That's very interesting. What's it worth, the gold and the jewels on it, I mean? Oh, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. But that's merely its intrinsic value. As an art relic, it's almost priceless. However, the last time I heard of the Bergenet was in Italy before the war. Yeah, but the man with the gun doesn't believe that. He thinks you've got it in your hip pocket. But then the man with the gun must be Leonardo Baltiera. That's right. How'd you know? <laughs> because the great uncle of Baltiera was the last rightful owner of the Bergenet. And Baltiera has his own interpretation of the laws of primogeniture. He shows up periodically to threaten, sue, and spy on importers the world over. <laughs> He's practically an international joke. Yes. Well, I find it hard to laugh at screwballs when my clients lie to me. Mind if I see the bill of lading on the silk? Sandra, show Mr. Marlowe all the papers on the silk transaction. Yes, of course. I hate to see him in doubt this way. It, uh, obviously it distresses him so. Sandra produced an armful of papers that looked more involved in the semi-annual report of the United States Gypsum Company. I poured over them until it was obvious to even the jade booters in the room that my real interest wasn't in any figure on paper. And then I left. When I got into my car and rolled out of the driveway onto Camden, a black coupe pulled up sharply on the other side of the street. A long, thin face that was jacking up a nut sandy head as stuff an ottoman stared at me like, like I was a cyclops wearing harlequins. And he didn't let it go at that. Because when I turned towards sunset, he swung around and followed. It stayed that way until we were out of Beverly Hills and along the strip. By then I got curious to see just how far he'd go. So I signaled for a stop with all the subtlety of a cub scout sending his first message by semaphore, and I pulled up in front of a sandwich shop. A minute after I entered and sat down at the counter, Sandy Hair joined me. When we each had a steaming cup of coffee in front of us, he opened up. You mind passing the sugar, fella? Not at all. Now, do you mind telling me why I'm being tailed? Huh? Come on, tip for tat, you've got your sugar. Okay. I saw you coming out of Norman Voorhees' place in Beverly Hills. Now, what's he to you? I could say it was my mother, but she wouldn't believe me. Ah, I'm wasting my time. Mm -hmm. Are you interested in making a lot of money for a little information? Uh, a reward, you might say? Always. Information about what? A blue burgonet. Say, I know a guy you ought to know. His name's Leonardo Baltiera, and blue burgonets are his hobby. Matter of fact, you might even say that he's crazy about them. I'm shoving off alone. Sandy Hair didn't bat an eye at the mention of Bautiera's name. But it didn't prove anything, and I knew that I'd still have to wait until 9 o'clock when I was due at the warehouse on Figueroa before I could start adding things up. It was only 5 then, so I went back to my apartment, showered, shaved, and grabbed a little sleep. And then after stopping off on La Brea at a prefabricated bit of old Spain, where I had a glass of stale Mexican beer, I took a cab to South Figueroa in the crate of silk. The place was a narrow, gray curtain storefront that widened in the rear to a warehouse. From the modest half-inch high gold letters and bullies in Porter, I gathered that my client didn't care much for the off-the-street trade. It was exactly nine o'clock when I knocked. It was two minutes after nine, and the knuckles on my right hand were bruised before a light went on inside, and Sandra Lane came to the door. Oh, Phil, I'm so glad you're here. Why? The price of silk dropping? Please tell down, Joe. I've heard nothing but strange noises in this warehouse ever since Mr. Voorhees left. Why, I finally locked myself in. Where is Voorhees? He had a phone call right after dinner. Something important. He asked me to wait for you. No? Where's the silk? In the back in the crate. Come on, let's hurry. All right. It's gone better off you. There's a truck and a driver waiting outside in the alley. Here's a bill of lading for the pilot of the plane. Phil. What is it? You'll... You'll be very careful, won't you? Why, Sandra? When you say it like that, how else can I be? Come on, baby, smile. After all, it's only a bowl of silk. Or is it? driver was all muscle and about as chatty as a Vermont farmer with laryngitis. Fifteen minutes later, when we pulled up at the airfield, we learned that our plane wouldn't be in for another half hour. I knew any scheduled delay, the two-plane one hang a grass-covered runway could mean anything from 60 minutes on up. So I sent the driver to scrounge some coffee, and I got out of the cab to stretch. <clears throat> That's fine, Marlo. What? Just keep them up. Oh, uh, 
Wow, sandy hair. What happened? Couldn't you come to terms with my friend Baltier? I didn't try. It looked like you'd lead me to what I wanted. Now it seems as though I'm right. Oh, you're not talking about this boss here, are you? Nothing else but Marlowe. And at this point, it would kill me to see it get into anyone else's hands. Then die! Oh, yes, by Pierre. And just in time to save everything that means anything to me. That pig, Hamilton. I should have done that to him a week ago in New York. It would have been simpler that way. No, you, Marlowe. Get in that truck. Wait a minute, Buck. Here, we've gone riding together before. It didn't do either of us any good. I know, Marlo, I know. But you didn't have the blue bergonet all wrapped up with you then, eh? Now, I ain't. Okay, okay. Yeah. Where are we going? Away, any place. Just so I can get the bergonet out of that ugly crate without interference from anyone, including you, Marlo. Buck, here, focus the muzzle of his gun in close to my right ear. Grinning like Svengali on Trilby's opening night, he put his foot on top of mine and shoved hard. The accelerator went to the floor and stayed there. Ah, oh, they thought they were so clever, those fools. Keep on this road until I tell you to turn. You're in for a big disappointment, Bob Kieran. There's silk in that box, that's all. Uh, you've been misled, Marlowe. The silk is nothing but camouflage for the burgundy. Oh, Voorhees is a shrewd little man, all right. What makes you think Voorhees had it? Because someone got it away from Hamilton just a few minutes ahead of me in New York. Uh, Hamilton knew who it was. I followed him, and he led me straight to Voorhees. You've been a busy little bee, haven't you? Uh, it's been harder than I anticipated. My original plan was subtle and perfect. I even sent my wife away on an extended vacation so they wouldn't be able to get at me to her. Uh, turn right on the side road, eh? You better let me slow down a little. We'll never make it. All right. I'm not free. Ah, uh, uh, they can strip me of money and position, but they can't keep me from the symbol of Baltierra power. Can't buy much power these days for 30,000 bucks. That's what your fancy war bonnet's worth. Oh, to you, cattle. Yes. Yeah. But the blood of ancestors that built an empire flows in my veins. To me, the Burgonet. Is the heart and soul of a tradition that will never die. I'm penniless now. But that golden helmet will be the source of an inspiration that will recreate the grandeur of my ancient family. Oh, brother, you wound up. You'll need a balcony and eight inches more chin to get away with that routine. Shut up. Stop over there, under those trees, and do just as I can. All right. Now what? Get out. On this side. Mm-hmm. Now push that box off onto the ground. Aren't you afraid I might bend up your precious heirloom? Uh, here is a tire iron. Rip the lid off. And a bullet flies fast. So don't try anything foolish. All right, all right. Yeah. Hot enough. Hot enough, it's loose. I'll be very pleased to do the rest to myself. Stand back there. Oh, I've waited for this moment. No! No, it can't be! Voris! Norman Voris. He's dead. You tricked me! The Bergen has Wait a minute, wait a minute, I didn't do that. You fool, you killed the only man who knows where the Bergen has to see them. He must be... Look, look, look. He's moving. What's that? There goes! <laughs> Jaw swung broadside to me, and I hung an hour never right on it that piled him into a heap behind the box. I took a quick look to be sure Boris was really dead. Then it struck me that whoever had popped him for shipment would go for Sandra next. I jumped into the truck and went back to the Figaro warehouse wide open. A single light still burned in the back. So I parked the truck and started around on foot. The side door was ajar, and when I looked in, I saw Sandra backed against the wall by a man holding her at gunpoint. <laughs> The sandy haired Mr. Hamilton. I couldn't hear what was being said until I eased the door open. Because enough to get inside. Where? I don't know. Really, I don't. Look, sister, you might as well tell me because I'm not leaving here until I know what happened to the Burgonet. Please, I told you, I don't know anything about You're it. You're lying. Boy, he's got it and you know it. Now, where is it? What was that? Look out, Sandra! Come on. That's all. Drop it. Drop it. Oh, no, you Come don't. Uh, drop it. Oh, Phil, are you all right? Yeah. Hey, miss me. It's kind of funny, though, how he collapsed all at once. I, I expected a real fight. It might be a trick. No, no, look at his face, like wet ashes. The guy's are cold. He really looks sick. 
Named Hamilton, but who is he, anyhow? I have no idea. All I know is he came in with a gun in his hand while I was waiting here for Mr. Voorhees. Voorhees? In a long wait, baby. Voorhees is dead. Oh, no. Yeah, I carried his body out of here myself, and that box we thought was full of silk. Murdered? That's right. Oh. Incidentally, Sandra, do you always wait around with your coat over your arm? Oh, no, I... Well, I... Phil, I'm scared. I... I've got to tell you the truth now. Mr. Voorhees had the blue bird in it. He said he bought it from someone. I don't know who. That shipment of silk to San Francisco was only a decoy to get Baltiero and this man Hamilton off the trail. Uh-huh. Baltiero was decoyed to a vacant lot all of ten whole minutes from here. Hamilton's right in our lap and Voorhees is dead. Fine. But those boys are playing for keeps. Where's the Bergen at now? I don't know. Please, Phil, believe me, I don't know anything more than that. I'm afraid. I want to get out of here. Uh-huh. I don't know, Mick. Uh-huh. Listen. It's all right, son. I got his gun. Let's bring him to and find out what his wrinkle is. Got some water handy, his head's been cut. Yes, there's water in the back. I'll go get some. Thanks. Okay, come on, Hamilton, wake up. Come on, come on, come to life. <laughs> Green jerking to my feet. I made an end run around a line of mean barges and dashed to the back door as the motor roared off down the alley. When I got to where I could see a pair of tail lights were just winking out of sight around the corner. And even before I turned, I heard another car coming up behind me. It was blacked out, and Leonardo Bartiera looked like a ghost that had just seen a ghost. He was at the wheel. I dived for cover as he threw some bullets in the general direction. Then he tunneled fast into an alley after the first car, leaving nothing but dusty darkness behind him. I'd been as outclassed as a stutterer at an auction. And I figured if I wanted to see Sandra's green eyes again, which I did, I'd better pry some fast answers out of Mr. Hamilton. He was tottering on a pair of rubber legs when I got to him, but I didn't give him the benefit of any doubt. Where's the girl? What happened back there? Nothing. Just kidnapping, reckless driving, and assault with a deadly weapon, and I'm in the same mood. So don't move until I finish calling the police. The, the police? You're going to call the law? Yeah. And then you're going to give out with some straight information. And if you don't think I mean it, just try getting tongue-tied and see what oh, happens. Oh, wait a minute, Marlowe. We've been wasting a lot of each other's time here. My membership card. H.J. Hamilton, investigator. Office of the Curator, Italo Hispanic Museum in Chicago. Well, I was suspicious of you at first, Marlowe. Yet all the time we were on the same team and didn't know it. <laughs> I hope the outside world never hears about this. Okay, Hamilton, how does the real story go? Like this, one, two, three. The museum inherited the Cellini helmet known as the Blue Bayonet from its owner, Alessandro Baltiero, who mm-hmm. killed in the war. He was Leonardo Baltiero's great uncle, and he disinherited that part years ago. Uh, I located the helmet in Italy and brought it to New York last week. It was stolen from me there, and everything points to one man as the thief. Mm-hmm. That's Norman Voorhees. And when we whoa, find him... Oh, Voorhees is dead. <laughs> you sure? I'm positive. His body was in the box at the airport. Leonardo Baltiero. No, no, no. Baltiero found the body, and it almost shocked him out of his accent. Look, what do you know that I don't about Sandra Lane? Nothing. She's Voorhees' assistant, that's all. Mm. She knows her boss had the helmet. She's in plenty of trouble right now. We better punch a hole in this setup and quick. Well, you're right. That shipment of silk was a side tracker, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. For you and Baltier. And a big piece of this thing is missing, Marlowe. There must be somebody else involved that we don't know about. Yeah. With you out of his hair, Vori's undoubtedly intended to get rid of the Bergenet tonight. It, ooh. Wait a minute. He did have an appointment tonight. Where? Who with? What was that guy's name? A, a red-faced, fat, a, a real laughing boy. I heard his name once. Bloody complexion, jovial. Yeah. Face. Could it be Corday? Corday. That's it. Fence, and we suspect a big one. Left Chicago three months ago. Lives in Beverly Hills now. Uh-huh. I've got an address on Oh, good. Yeah. Come on, yeah. find it. Uh, yeah. Here. Uh-huh. Uh, 621 North Maple. It's a long shot. Well, what can we lose at this point? Besides, it's about our turn for a break. Hey, you, you really look beat. You sure you can make it? I wouldn't miss it for anything. Let's go. <laughs> on the head Baltiera had given him at the airstrip. When we turned into North Maple Drive, only one of the half a dozen houses on the block had a light burning. As we got nearer, that blinked out. It was number 621. I went around a corner to be out of sight from the house and stopped the car. The light going out might have been a coincidence, Marlowe, but let's not count on it. In this tournament of button button, I wouldn't count on my own father. Now look, Hamilton, you're not too chipper. So I'll go in. All right. But as soon as I'm up to the door, you give me some close support from that big front window. Or our brother act might get the hook before we get out of the wings. Now remember, whatever. 
Whatever I do, I'll bank on your covering me, okay? Yeah, yeah, okay, Marlo. And for comfort, keep your collar open. You're liable to get a very warm reception. I walked around the corner, cut diagonally across the street, and went up the steps to the heavy panel door. I glanced back once and saw Hamilton moving slowly next to a high hedge that kept him hidden from anyone inside the house watching. I waited a moment and got a grip on my gun and then knocked good and loud. I waited again and listened, but nothing happened. From then on, I knew it was a trap. And I felt as comfortable as the last man in a round of Russian roulette. I was sure even before I touched the handle, the door was going to be unlocked. And it was. I ducked low and stepped into one side fast. Then I pressed my back against the wall and moved along the short hallway to the living room. Still nothing happened. Faint light that filtered in through the big front window fell across something on the floor. It took me several seconds to figure out that it was a body. I looked at the window again and saw Hamilton move outside, so it was time for light. I felt for a switch, found one, turned it on. Body on the floor was about here. He'd been shot. I walked clear across the room and bent over him before Corday made his move. You've got two choices, laddie. Drop your pistol and stand up, or hang on to it and lay down beside that fellow on the floor there. Thanks, I'll stand. <laughs> You behave very well for a party crasher. And you throw rough parties. Did you do it, Cody? No, he didn't. Hello? I did, Marlowe. I had to. Sandra. A few minutes ago, my husband broke in here and tried to kill me. That's why I had to kill him. Your husband? Yes. I'm Mrs. Leonardo Baltiera. You're also a clumsy, hot-headed vixen. Oh, stop it. Uh... Could I help it? You sent me for water at the warehouse tonight, Marlowe. I took that opportunity to get away because I had the helmet in the trunk of my car. I practically fell over Leonardo outside. When he saw me there, he realized I'd been working with Voorhees right from the start. He was murderous. But you didn't have to leave him here and kill him on my living room floor. You're a real sweetheart, you are, baby. And you killed Voorhees, too, huh? Yes. I went in with him because that idiot husband of mine would let me starve rather than sell the burgonet if he got it. But Voorhees was greedy. He double-crossed me by trying to sell it to Corday here without me. Once the jewels were stripped and the gold melted down, the trail would end, of course. I would be out. And that would have been fine by me. Norman Voorhees, at least, was a very deep, efficient little man. Well, he's a very dead little man, so shut up about it. I'm getting nervous. Let's get rid of Marlowe here some way and finish our business. Not so fast. You made a fine mess of things. Murder on the floor, private dicks in the house. How can I stay in my business with things like that happening? And before we settle anything else, we're going to clean it all up. Here, girl, take my gun. You're handy with them. All right, Marlowe, take mm-hmm. the dead man's shoulder. Oh, sure. We're going to carry him out back to my car. Oh, of course, anything. Anything to help out. Wait. Huh? I might have known it. That's what I get for dealing with amateurs. What's the matter now? Look at him. He wants to go outside. Well, don't you get it yet? He's got help out there. Hamilton? That's right, kid. You scatterbrained fools, Sandra. You got me into this. Say that, Cordy. Give me that gun. No. Uh, no. I'll stay where you are. Both of you. Keep your hands up, Corday. Okay, Hamilton. You can come in now. Everything's under control. Hamilton. Hamilton? Huh? Oh, Marlo. What happened? What happened? Where were you? Well, I... I guess the minute I got here to the window, I... I... I must have passed out. Oh, Fine. I was in here making brave, and you were out there, passed out cold. I slept in the next day and didn't get to my office until afternoon. I found then that Hamilton had been calling all morning. When I returned his call, he said that on his recommendation, the museum would pay me 25 a day plus expenses to deliver the Blue Bergenette to Chicago. He added that I had nothing to worry about because it would be packed in a well-labeled box to look like a shipment of Hickok belts and garters. <laughs> but Hamilton was calling from the hospital. He had a fractured skull from the blow Valtiera had given him at the airport. So I'm going to take the job, all right. But just as a safety measure, I'm not going to carry that helmet in any box. I'm going to wear it. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond T. 
Chandler stars Gerald Moore and is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Featured in tonight's cast were Betty Lou Gerson, Hans Conrad, Alan Reed, Louis Van Ruten, and Howard McNair. The special music was conceived and conducted by Richard O'Ron. Be sure to be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... Strange things were going on that night. There was a wild stallion waiting in a garage, a gladiator with a chip on his shoulder, and a nasty storm brewing overhead. All I had to do was keep an angel out of trouble, and that sounded easy. Until I found out that even an angel can be too hot to handle. The Adventures Now, living out in the open in the summer is fine. But living in the open in winter is quite a different matter. But that's exactly where you'll find millions of people in Europe and Asia. And many of those living outside are children. Support the Crusade for Children. Remember, the Crusade for Children represents 26 long-established relief agencies. Your gift goes to all these agencies. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. KNX Los Angeles, AM and Welcome back. Well, a really exciting uh, Philip Marlowe adventure. Uh, as typical, you get a uh, good mix of mystery, hard-boiled dialogue, uh, some fun Chandler-esque characters, and just the right little bit of humor mixed in. My favorite part has to be at the end, where uh, on the basis of the federal investigator being there, he convinces the villains to surrender, uh, only for it to turn out the investigator had gone to sleep. And I also liked his line about wearing the blue burgundy. Really so very happy that I was finally able to bring this to you. It's uh, just such a fun Philip Marlowe story, and fills the gap in the biggest hole in the series, because with the Blue Burgonette, uh, there are now the first six episodes of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe in circulation, and then six of the next seven episodes are missing, which is the biggest gap in the series. Uh, the most after this initial uh, missing episode spate, uh, there's only one or two episodes in a row missing uh, throughout the rest of the run of the series. While this is the last of our newly circulated Philip Marlowe episodes, this isn't the last of Gerald Moore. Because the series we're going to start playing uh, next Tuesday, The Adventures of Bill Lance, actually stars Moore. So be sure to check that out. All right, well, I do want to go ahead and give you an update on our lineup of programs to come on Tuesday. And once again, due to uh, new episodes coming into circulation, we've had to shuffle that about again. Uh, when we get into the Bob Bailey, Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar episodes, we're going to be playing Johnny Dollar on Tuesdays and Fridays. We have to have the schedule clear when that comes. Now, after the adventures of Bill Lance, we're going to be in previously uncirculated episodes for about 10 months. And that will be between two series, so we're not going to be hopping around a lot. Uh, so our new tentative uh, schedule for what we're going to hear in uh, season 13 is we're going to bring you Martin Kane, This is O'Shea, Meet Miss Sherlock, all rather short story, uh, series. And then we'll bring you the Australian series, I Hate Crime. And then we have Adventures of PC-49, Matthew Slade, and Sarah's Private Capers, uh, scheduled, uh, again, very tentatively in pencil for uh, season uh, 14. But again, all this subject to change. Now, listener comments and feedback, and we got a couple of different comments regarding the Sherlock Holmes episode. And we'll start over on Podbean. And a listener comments regarding the Sherlock Holmes episode, Death at Stonehenge. Love how they make women so emotional after a death. 
Women are more level-headed than that. Uh, well, thanks for the comment. Certainly, death, particularly a sudden one, can bring a pretty strong emotional reaction from both men and women. But that said, uh, certain radio programs did turn, tend to overdo it. And the same could be said of film, particularly of that era. One of the big challenges is that for the longest time, acting was acting for the stage. And often to convey something, you need to do it in a very big way. You know, we, we call it theatrical for a reason. Doing that same really big performance, which was perfectly fine on stage, can really feel, feel over the top and way too much on radio. And certainly radio did get better with that over time. So I do think that New York, where I believe the Sherlock Holmes was recorded, uh, the acting tended to be more emotional, go more over the top. And that could be heard, certainly, Mr. Keene's Racer of Lost Persons, the sort of uh, flagship uh, detective program that came out of New York, had that sort of heightened emotion. But you would also hear it, you know, even on things like Casey. You know, it would not be like all the time, but you, you can hear it sometimes where you get really heightened. In, in a way, you just don't really hear that much on Hollywood... Uh, based uh, programs. I don't know why that is. It might be because uh, r radio uh, in New York City tended to hire uh, theatrical actors much more than Hollywood uh, productions, which relied on uh, picture actors more. And pictures, uh, you know, I think after the 1930s, began to dial down the emotion to a more believable and realistic level. And then I have a comment on the same episode from uh, Stephen who writes, what a treat to get a new Sherlock Holmes episode. I've listened to all the others many times over. Richard Gordon has an interesting voice. He sounds slightly nerdy, which Sherlock Holmes probably would have been. After Rathbone, anyone cast as Holmes on radio had to have a deep, resonant voice. Conway, Stanley, Hobbs, uh, Marison. So this was a pretty good and different portrayal for me. Well, thanks for the comment, Stephen. And I think you're right. Uh, before, uh, before Rathbone, I think if there was a definitional voice, um, it was William Gillette. You know, you listen to uh, the way that Orson Welles described Gillette and how... Uh, how Sherlock Holmes resembled, you know, William Gillette. And I think certainly uh, sounded like him. And the way that Wells did the performance on Sunday, it did remind me a little bit of the way that uh, Gordon uh, did it, though obviously uh, very different uh, actors. Uh, because, yeah, and I think today we we are more open to slightly differing uh, portrayals of Holmes. Uh, though I think in some cases uh, we'll, we'll just kind of look at something and say, nah, nope, nope. Uh, of course, the story with Rathbone and the actors who sounded like him, uh, it was something that actually annoyed Rathbone because... Yeah, he kept getting asked, you know, about episodes of Sherlock Holmes and what was going on with the program after he had left uh, Sherlock Holmes because they hired actors who could get into the same range. And so people thought that Basil Rathbone was still doing it. And this annoyed him. It's like, no, I stopped it. Stop using my voice. But there's really not a whole lot that uh, you can do as an actor in those sort of cases. But thank you so much for the comment, Stephen. And now I want to go ahead and thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Gary, Patreon supporter since August 2016, currently supporting the program at the rookie level of $2 or more per month. 
And a reminder that during our listener support campaign, well, and all year round too, but focused during the listener support campaign, you can join Gary and uh, more than 250 other listeners in supporting the program for as little as $2 per month. Just go to patreon.greatdetectives.net and you get a uh, newsletter from me every month as well as uh, little sneak peeks and the opportunity to choose our annual summer series for the amazing world of radio. But that will do it for today. If you are enjoying this podcast, be sure to rate and review it wherever you download your podcast from. Join us back here tomorrow for The Man Called X. And coming up on Saturday, be sure and listen for Top Secrets of the FBI. Next Tuesday, we'll be back with the adventures of Bill Lance. And then next Saturday, be sure and listen for Squad Room. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Check out our Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. And follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.